يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلما بلغ معه السعي قال يا بني إني أرى في المنام أني إني أني أذبحك فانظر ماذا ترى قال يا أبا تفعل ما تؤمر ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين in today's khutbah, inshallah, I'd like to share with you a few ayat from the Qur'an that deal with the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. All of us are all too familiar that this Eid is really a celebration of his sacrifices and his legacy. And I try in every one of the Eid al-Adha prayers, if I get the opportunity to do the khutbah, to highlight something about Ibrahim alayhi salam that I haven't done before. And so is the case today. The first thing I want to highlight is just the meaning of sacrifice. The word sacrifice actually in the Qur'an doesn't exist much. The word ithara comes which is to give preference to others over yourself. The word dhibh literally comes in the means of slaughtering or sacrificing an animal. But like in English literature, when we talk about somebody who sacrificed a lot, to get successful or sacrifice a lot of money or sacrifice a lot of time and things like that. That term isn't used. The reason why it's not used is because at the essence of the term sacrifice in the English literature is the idea that you give something up that you're never going to get back again. That's the idea of sacrifice. And that fundamentally does not exist in Islam. There's nothing we do for Allah that goes away and never comes back. Nothing. وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ for, you know, for you ilaykum. Everything you spend is going to be bring, brought back to you. Everything will be refunded. There's not a prayer we did, not a penny we spent, not a, not a second we spent doing something that isn't actually recorded for ourselves. So technically, there isn't actually such a thing as the English term sacrifice. Really, there isn't. There are great accomplishments and struggles. Those are there, and acts of submission, great acts of submission. So even though in English, when we talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam, we use the term sacrifice. When Quran talks about Ibrahim alayhi salam, it uses constantly the word Islam. Aslama. Like the ayah I recited from Baqarah in the prayer. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Whenever his master said to him, submit, he said, I submit before the master of all nations, all peoples. In, in other words, what makes him incredible is his willingness to submit. His willingness to say, Ya Allah, you're right, I'm wrong. I'm willing to put all of my opinions aside and do whatever you say, I'm ready to go. That is his Islam, that is what makes him awesome. That is what makes him a role model. To the point where the final messenger of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is told not to follow anybody else's legacy, even though he is given the stories of previous prophets for himself also, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he is explicitly told, فَاتَّبِعْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا You follow the legacy of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. Why? Because he is, the, he is the role model of what it means to be in Islam to be in Islam. So one of those things that I wanted to highlight to you today is actually from Surah Al-Safat. And in Surah Al-Safat we learn some new or interesting things about Ibrahim alayhi salam and I'm going to start with a prayer. And this is by the way a prayer after he was thrown in the fire. You guys know the story about when he was thrown in the fire. This is after he was thrown in the fire and Allah rescued him. He's already shown to Allah he's not even afraid of a flame. And by the way, that wasn't just a fire. The fire was so high, birds couldn't fly over, they would fall in. That's how, how towering the flame was. And literally they didn't, you know, usually you just put some wood together and you make a fire. But these guys actually put a building together. Quran says, Ubnu lahum lahu bunyanan. Build a building for him. Then set it on fire, then throw him in it. Oh my God, these people were like, you know, they, they were bloodthirsty for him. And he's about to be thrown in this building and he's completely satisfied with Allah's will. And now when he passes that test, now he's in a position to make dua. So we learned something already. When Allah puts you through a test, and me through a test, and we're able to come out of that test in submission to Allah. You know, when we're tested, usually things go bad. We start questioning Allah, we start disobeying Allah, we start justifying our, our misbehavior. But there are people who when difficult times come, they become even more in submission to Allah. And those are the people that can make the best kinds of du'as to Allah. The, the best du'as and the most incredible du'as and Allah will immediately accept them. So he makes this one du'a, Rabbi habli min as salihin Ya Allah give me a gift of, from among the righteous, give me a child that's good. Give me a good child. 
The very next ayah says, فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ We gave him, we congratulated him on a boy. He's gonna have a boy. And he's gonna have this quality, the Qur'an describes as Halim. Now Halim means at least three things that I wanna highlight and I wanna try that you remember. This is talking about Ismail alayhi salam. The first meaning of Halim is someone who doesn't overreact. Who does not overreact. So you know there's one idea to be patient. But an idea even above that is you don't even show a reaction. So you're supposed to get angry and you're just still calm. There's one thing to swallow your anger. You look angry but you didn't yell. You're patient. But you're Halim if you don't even look angry. You're supposed to but you got some real thick skin. You can hold it. You're supposed to be scared but you can hold it in. You've got nerves of steel they call it in, in modern ling lingo, right? Nerves of steel. This is one of the meanings of Halim. The second meaning of Halim is someone who has been tested through difficult times. So you're gonna have a boy who's gonna have some tough tests in life. Halum al-Rajul they say, إِذَا جُرِّبَ You know, al-Hazam. If uh, they say a man has hilm, if, he's, if difficult things have tested him in life, he's gone through some tough things. Now this boy from the very birth, from the very birth, as a baby, he has been tested with almost dying of dehydration. You remember that? So from the very beginning, he's been tested. And Allah Azza wa Jal didn't just say you're gonna have a child, He said you're gonna have a ghulam. You're gonna have a boy. Ghulam is used when you're like 9, 10, you reach older age. When did Ibrahim alayhi salam leave this child in the desert? When he was an infant. But Allah had already told him this boy is going to be 9, 10 years old. Don't worry, you're, get, you're gonna get to see him when he's older. So Ibrahim alayhi salam already knew this child will not die in the desert. He absolutely knew, Allah already told him. Just by the word hula. So there's, the first meaning was, someone, or the second meaning rather was, someone who's been tested. Someone who's been tested. The third and final, so the first is nerves of steel, second someone who's been tested, and the third and final meaning of halim is someone who, ha, who has reached the age of maturity. So they say, al hulum, they say in Arabic, when somebody becomes a young man. So not only will he be a young boy, he's gonna mature into a young man. So the third meaning of it has to do with age. It has to do with age, okay? And the idea of that is, well, when, you're, when you reach age, then obviously tests are going to come and you're supposed to be able to control yourself. Children can't control themselves. Children, when they feel like crying, they cry. When they want something, they just take it. When they want to eat something, they just grab. Whether the, the rest of the plate falls on the floor or not, they don't think about the consequences, they just do it. But adults can hold themselves back. They reach hulum. They can hold themselves back. So the idea of maturity is embedded inside the meaning. So this is a gift Allah gave to Ibrahim alayhi salam. What are we learning? We're learning this is one of the du'as we're supposed to make for our children. That Allah make them strong through difficult times. That's one meaning. That, we, that Allah make them strong through difficult times. Then another meaning that Allah azza wa when He puts them in these kinds of situations, they behave in a mature way. They behave maturely, subhanAllah. This is the meaning of Ghulam Halim. So this is Ismail alayhi salam. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي Amazing language. When this boy reached the age where he could run with his father. مَعَهُ Along with him. Now what we're learning is the old man, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who's old now, alayhi salam, is now spending time with his son. And they do activities together. He takes him to work, they go out on the farm, whatever they do, they go together. مَعَهُ السَّعِي and he starts seeing this dream. You guys know what the dream is. And it's not one time that he sees this dream. He sees it over and over and over again. That's why inni ara is used. Inna is used in the ayah because he says, I, he, he says he's about to tell his son, he's not sure if his son's gonna believe him. Now imagine this 16, 17, 18 year old young man. Young man. And you go over to him and you say, listen son, I keep seeing this dream that I'm slaughtering you. That I'm slaughtering you. And he sees it one time, two times, three times. You think it's easy to tell your son that? No. And obviously he compels to t he's compelled to tell his son because he gets an idea from wahi that he's supposed to tell his son. Obviously you and I see disturbing dreams all the time. Doesn't mean we go tell our kids. You know, doesn't mean we tell the wife. But he feels compelled he has to tell his son. Now his son is a teen. When teenagers hear something like that, what do they do? Dad, what did you have for dinner last night? I mean, seriously, Dad. You, you, you know, there wasn't enough. You left us in the middle of the desert. I remember what mom told me about the desert thing. Okay, now this is round two. What is with you and me? Why are you want after me? No, no, no. No reaction from him. 
No reaction from him. He says, I, you know, I see that I'm slaughtering you. Now, this dream, because it's a dream of a prophet, it's revelation. It's revelation. So he has to fulfill it. But there are two parties in this dream, the one who is slaughtering and the one who's being slaughtered. Now he can't force his son. He can't, he realizes that. There need to be two people who submit to Allah for this to happen. Not just the father. That's hard enough. Not just the father, but also the son. So what does he do? He says, son, I see in my dream that I slaughter you. Fandur, take a good look. Nadara in Arabic means to look at something, think about something for a long time. Mada tara? What do you see? The father is asking his son, what do you think, son? I'm telling you this is what I see, but I don't want you to respond right now. I want you to think about this and let me know. <coughs> Subhanallah. That must have been a difficult conversation. Especially with a teen. And yet the son is so mature that the, the man who's a prophet, a messenger of Allah, Ibrahim salam, says, I need to value his opinion. What do you think, son? What's your opinion? Fandur mada tara? Take a good look. What do you what's your fatwa on this? You know, what's your what's your take? What are we learning here? We're learning as badly as the father wants to submit to Allah in a family, everybody has to make their own decision. Our children are getting older. And you're starting to learn, some of you who's become, who become parents of teenagers, they're starting to make their own decisions. They're starting to become more and more and more independent. And your opinion is not always the same as their opinion. Actually your opinion is mostly not the same as their opinion. You know, you want to go here, they want to go there. You want to stay home, they want to go out. You want to go out, they want to stay home. It's always the other way around. And you know what? One of the things we're learning from the legacy of Ibrahim salam is to respect the opinion of our young growing children to give them maturity. If we're always telling them what to do, because Ibrahim salam could just say, Hey son, this is revelation. You need to come over here and lie down. But he doesn't. He says, what's your opinion? What do you think? Now this could go any way. This could go in any direction. And what does he say? قال, he says, Ya Abati, Dad, I love you. Ya Abati, the ta there is for love and respect. Dad, I respect you and I love you, Dad. If alma tu'mar, do what you've been told to do. Just do it. If al means don't even think about it. I know it's a revelation. I can tell this boy is smart, so he knows it's revelation. He also knows this dad would never have brought it up if it wasn't from Allah. He knows that. He's already processed all of that. He doesn't have to question his father and say, Where'd you get that from? You think it's wahi? You really think Allah wants me to die? What do you, I mean, what is, you know, what's my fault in all of this? What have I done? I've got my whole life ahead of me. You know, whatever dad. Uh-uh. He says, dad, do what you've been told. Because I know it's from Allah. The legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam is about being happy with whatever Allah decides. Being happy with what Allah decides. This son is happy with what Allah decided. If alma tu'mar, do whatever you've been told. Satajiduni, insha'Allah min as sabirin you will find me if Allah wants. Insha'Allah, we say that all the time. If you, if Allah wants, you'll find me patient. Because you know, I'm, I've made this decision, but once the knife hits, I might react out of pain. And I can't even control that, so hopefully I'll be patient. I know the limits of myself, my will is enough that I want to be patient, but once it strikes and the body just has reactions, right? And it might show like I don't have sabr, hopefully Allah will give me the sabr. Insha'Allah. Satajidudi insha'Allah min as-sabirin. Subhanallah. What an incredible speech by this young man. Falamma aslama. What a beautiful ayah. He, Allah says, then finally, when both of them submitted. Can you imagine that walk? Can you imagine where they're heading up and they're, they're about to go and <laughs> at the slaughter and they're talking to each other about how this is going to be, this is good for Allah. This is good, Allah wants good for us, He doesn't want bad for us. He would never want to harm us. The father is shedding tears but he knows it's good. The son is shedding tears, his life is about to end but he knows it's good. He's still walking towards, he's not running away. Talla is used when somebody is shaking, when the animal shakes, and you put your hand on the animal and the head is sh still shaking. There's vibration. The sun was shivering when he put his neck down. He was shivering. He's a boy, you know? And then Lil Jabin, right here by the side of the neck. And Jabin also, Ibrahim salam put his head on his forehead where the hairline meets. His head was right here. And he could feel the shivering of his son. 
He could do that. Why did Allah describe all of this to us? Why did He do that? Every year at this day, how many millions of animals are sacrificed? How many millions of animals? Why are they sacrificed? Because Ibrahim salam was willing to go that far. He was willing to feel the, 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 the shaking of his son. You know, the, the vibrations of his son's fear. And his son was willing to fight his fear and still be patient and stay lying down. He was able to do that because they knew Allah would never want something bad for us. Allah would never want. The same Allah who can make a fire cold, the same Allah who can bring water out of a desert, is the same Allah that can save my child no matter what. I, 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 and if He wants him to die, then it's the best thing for him. That's submission, that's Islam. That's Islam. Allah didn't ask me to jump into a fire, He didn't ask you to jump into a fire. Allah didn't ask us to leave our family in the middle of death. He didn't do that. Allah didn't ask us to put a knife to our children. He didn't do that. He asked Ibrahim salam impossible things. And we are to this day thanking Allah that we get to follow His legacy even though we don't even compare. We don't even compare. And yet every time we slaughter an animal, we become part of the legacy of Ibrahim salam. This is our way of thanking Allah. Ya Allah, thanks for making our test a lot easier than His. Thanks for ransoming that sacrifice with that of an animal. فَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ We ransomed him for a great sacrifice because it's not just one sacrifice. It's all of our sacrifices. All of them. All of them. This is what we're celebrating today. What Allah asked of him and what Allah is asking of you and me. And how we, we have the audacity, the obnoxious attitude to say, man, Islam's hard, man. It's too much. Allah wants just too much. Everything's haram. You gotta do so much for Allah. It's just ridiculous. You know, can't do this, can't do that. And we, we have the attitude of complaining. You don't see this teenage boy complaining. You don't see this father complaining as they're walking up, heading to a slaughter and saying, I can't believe Islam wants me to do this. What kind of religion is this? What kind of God would want me to do that? No questioning. That's what Islam is. I pray that Allah Azza wa gives us Islam. I pray that Allah Azza wa makes us a people who internalize and fall in love with the beautiful legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. I pray that those of us who took advantage, and all, inshallah all of us did, the ones who took advantage of the, the wonderful opportunity yesterday, of the day of Arafah to make dua, so that, uh, you know, and if those of us who fasted, that Allah accepts their fast, so that a year of the sins from before and the year of the sins that are coming after are taken away, they are forgiven. That is the opportunity Allah Azza gave us. I pray that Allah accepts the Hajj of all of those who have made this incredible journey and we pray that Allah accepts all of their du'as and all of their sacrifices and Allah brings all of them back home safely. I pray that all of us that are not here this year, that all of them are given forgiveness by Allah Azza wa Jal. I pray that we are able to instill a love, not just a knowledge, but a love of the Prophets and their great legacies into ourselves and into our children. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazeen astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al-nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد عيد مبارك to all of you